Hey everyone, Dr. Jack Orty here, and today I'm gonna to take you through some background on neutrophils, so I can then take you through how neutrophils respond and contribute to SARS-CoV-2 uh, or COVID-19 disease. So let's just jump into it, neutrophils here. Uh, neutrophils come from your bone marrow, much like all uh, white blood cells that float around your blood and the red blood cells, they come from your bone marrow. Neutrophils are, are your number one white blood cell, they're the majority of your white blood cells, and they're there for a short time, not a long time, typically lasting around 60 hours in circulation, and they're constant, constantly being replenished from the bone marrow. Should you get an infection, your bone marrow will pump out even more neutrophils, which is really interesting. Um, now, they are your major early responders to infection or tissue damage, and when they do their thing, when they kill the bacteria, kill the virus, when they or, or release their granules, they typically die. And so if we were to look in pus, we would, say, we would find out that pus is actually made up of the dead bodies of neutrophils predominantly. So the neutrophils have gone in and died, and that generates pus, which is interesting. It's actually going to be a bit of a gross episode today. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, neutrophils are the number one white blood cell in humans, but not all other animals. In fact, most other animals have more lymphocytes than neutrophils or even um, uh, or monocytes. So most animals have way more lymphocytes than innate immune cells. Humans have a huge number of neutrophils. Now, there's a few hypotheses out there as why that is. And my favorite one is that we're darn tootin' filthy, right? So um, we all migrated into cities throughout human, ev human evolution, and we lived in incredible, incredible close proximity. Um, and those early towns had problems with sewage. There was also livestock in those early towns. And so we lived in filth and squalor. So we had the Black Plague, we had polio, smallpox, we had all these diseases dramatically affect human, um, human evolution. And so as part of this response of living in this filthy environment, uh, we produced a huge, we increased our neutrophilic response. Um, making humans very inflammatory. And some people think this uh, inflammatory status of humans is why we're uniquely susceptible to inflammatory diseases uh, like cardiovascular disease or dementia or, or um, arthritis, that kind of stuff. Um, and what's interesting about that is the other two animals that e have equally high neutrophils are animals that have undergone domestication with humans. Um, so dogs, remember, were wolves um, 15,000 years ago or whatnot. So they have um, undergone the same selection pressures as humans. They're also carnivores, which might explain it. And so they're eating raw meat, like raw chicken, which um, has, comes with a greater risk of food poisoning. So perhaps uh, neutrophils, which are the early responders, are more important when you're uh, constantly exposed to a wide range of different pathogens. That is all just conjecture though, it's very interesting though. So here's the anatomy of the neutrophil, we have a lobular nuclei, it's a very peculiar shaped nuclei, and in the cytosol we have granules, and these granules are crucial to the neutrophil function. They contain the main components that kill the pathogens, and we're going to go into that later on. Um, but why do, look at this happy little neutrophil, why do neutrophils have that funky nuclei? Well, it's to do with migration. So neutrophils flowing around your bloodstream have to squeeze, if they want to leave the bloodstream, they have to squeeze through very tiny gaps, very tiny gaps. So neutrophils are 10 microns wide and they squeeze through gaps that are 0.1 micron wide. So that's one one hundredth of the width of their body. They have to squeeze through that gap. So having a peculiar thin shaped neutrophil helps with this migration through this very tight space. So here we have a neutrophil kind of in brown and we have two endothelial cells, the cells that line the blood vessels here. And this neutrophil is squeezing through it. And it's kind of shoved its bag of granules through first, and then its weird lobular nuclei will squeeze through second. Um, and this is the diagram I drew just out of my head. And I was like, man, that's pretty accurate. That's pretty good drawing. That's done on PowerPoint, man. Woo, good illustrations. Okay, so, um, just a quick background because I've already covered this, but neutrophils flow around the blood until there's an inflammatory response. The inflammatory response causes adhesion molecules to be expressed on the neutrophil and on the endothelial cells lining the blood cells. So the neutrophils will adhere 
and slow down on the blood vessel wall and then they will crawl up a chemokine gradient um, so they'll migrate up a chemokine which is a, an inflammatory cytokine being released by a, a resident immune cell that's in the tissue and through that we'll get neutrophil migration now let's just jump into the main functions of the neutrophil so the main functions of the neutrophil are phagocytosis cytokine production netosis which is an awesome thing it stands for neutrophil extracellular traps and it's a form of death so that's why it's called osis netosis but we'll learn that they don't always die and degranulation those are the four main functions so we're going to cover um, phagocytosis and cytokine release in this video so let's start with phagocytosis here we can see this awesome neutrophil and he is chasing this little bacteria he'll be tracking the pathogen associated molecular patterns that are released off that bacteria and will be crawling up the concentration gradient of those PAMPs the pathogen associated molecular pattern so where is it here here it is there and you can see the neutrophil is chasing it through these are red blood cells and the neutrophil is just knocking the red blood cells out of the way to get to this so phagocytosis it's actually a bit more complicated there are multiple kinds of phagocytosis so there's the um, canonical phagocytotic pathway and essentially um, we have a particle or a pathogen that the neutrophil wants to eat it will ruffle its membrane so its membrane will not be smooth and round it will be, become ruffle and those ruffles will extend out and around the particle and bring the particle in and this can be helped by opsonization so opsonization is when a molecule that we produce sticks to the pathogen and it sticks to receptors on the neutrophil surface to encourage the phagocytosis and um, opsonization can occur through um, antibodies but also uh, complement proteins do a similar function they can help the neutrophil eat uh, the particle so it's aided by um, this opsonization but the key thing here is the cytoskeleton uh, um, which is made up of actin is what allows the ruffling of the membrane and the membrane to grow around the particulate and pull it in there's a couple of other kinds so there's clathrin and caviolin which is loosely just um, protein structured related intake so these are specifically designed proteins that have a kind of a unique shape i like to think of it like this they have a little curve on them and then they have an attachment site for the uh, membrane in the middle so if they were say this is the membrane it's nice and flat when this protein comes along and attaches to it it dents the membrane and so then another protein comes along and another protein comes along and they slowly kind of curve the membrane in and pull bud it in now this can handle much smaller particles so um while a bacteria could be phagocytosed as well as um, viruses and fungi typically bacteria and fungi uh, won't go through the clathrin pathway more often they'll be phagocytosed whereas viruses can go through these protein mediated endocytotic pathways and then we have another one which is macropinocytosis this is um, a very unique thing it's actually more done in macrophages but neutrophils can do it and this is when a whole process a whole um yeah almost like you've got your cell a whole process will grow out and around whatever it's wanting to intake and then it will seal on the other side it's a little bit like phagocytosis but it's um it's for much larger particles and it requires the membrane to crawl around whatever it's going to take in and then bud in it's very very cool um, and it's for incredibly large particles so it depends on the size of the particle on which pathway um, it will get into the cell by but all of these pathways can be used to take in pathogens particularly viruses um, and so then what happens so when when i talked about phagocytosis previously when i was talking about macrophages i say a lysosome fuses with the phagosome in a neutrophil because they're a granular site and they're defined by these really cool granules that are full of bactericidal and pathogen killing compounds um, it's actually typically a granule that will fuse with the phagolysosome so one of these um, granules in here these big black granules that are full of bactericidal compounds will fuse with the phagolysosome and definitely kill whatever in there it's just such a super killer 
and we can see the phagocytosis is a very important way that neutrophils kill things so uh in this paper what they did was they put neutrophils on bacteria and then counted the number of bacteria that got killed by the neutrophils um, and what they did was they put this compound called cytochalasin d cyto d and what that does is it prevents actin polymerization so actin is the skeleton of the cell so for in order for phagocytosis or macropinocytosis to occur in which the cell structure changes and it grows around the particulate that it's going to bring in in order for that to happen you need the cytok skeleton to push out it's the it's the actin filaments that are pushing that membrane out the membrane can't do it by itself it's a floppy phospholipid it needs that protein cytoskeleton to polymerize and grow out around the pathogen. Now cytochalase D blocks actin monomers joining onto each other, so it blocks the formation of those filaments. And when you block the formation of the filaments, you dramatically reduce the number of bacteria killed by the neutrophils. So neutro phagocytosis is a very important pathway in which neutrophils kill pathogens in your body. So even though we always talk about phagocytosis with macrophages, and we normally talk about degranulation when we're talking about neutrophils, phagocytosis is still really important for neutrophils. Okay, so let's move on to cytokine production. So, you know, this is the production of those inflammatory signaling molecules that regulate the inflammatory response, like IL-6, TNF-alpha, or IL-1. IL standing for interleukin. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is what we're talking about here, where we get activation of these receptors, these pathogen um, PAMP detecting receptors, so pathogen associated molecular pattern detecting receptors, or damage associated molecular patterns, DAMP detecting molecules. Um, so these receptors are activated, and then typically you get cytokine signaling. So in this case, um, cytokine or prostaglandin signaling, for example. So you get the signaling of the inflammatory response. Um, but what we, what we notice is that neutrophils have much lower levels of those receptors. So this is just one of these receptors. So this is TLR4, which is the LPS detecting PAMP receptor that um, most cells express. So here we have a parenchymal cell, so that, and we're measuring the amount of RNA using PCR, quantitative PCR. It's a way to look at how turned on this gene is. So we're quantifying how turned on is the TLR4 gene in a range of different cell types. So in a parenchymal cell, which just means the tissue cell in black, we can see that there's, it, the gene isn't really turned on that much. It's turned on at very low levels. If we look at resident macrophages, we see very high levels of TLR4. Then we look at migrated macrophages that have come from outside the tissue. Maybe they were a monocyte that then turned into a macrophage. And we can see that they've still got high levels of this PAMP detector, TLR4. Whereas neutrophils barely have it. They've got a very low level of TLR4. They can still respond to LPS. Um, so can parenchymal cells a little bit, but it's not their major role. You can see that a macrophage is there to detect pathogens. It is, it is a sensing cell. Whereas neutrophils, because they float around the blood and wait to be activated and migrated into the tissue, they're not a major expressor of these PAMPs. And similarly, they don't express uh, inflammatory signaling molecules at as high levels as the macrophages, the resident macrophages. They still express them quite a lot compared to control, and it's hard to sort of quantify this, but this is IL-1 beta, which is an inflammatory cytokine, and these guys have been stimulated with ATP. Now remember, ATP should be inside cells. It's the energy molecule of the cell. So if ATP is outside the cell, you know some cells have popped. So it's a classic damp a damage associated molecular pattern here so here we can see a blade has come into this tissue and it's popped these cells and they have leaked out atp which can then go on to be detected by an immune cell so we treated these cells with atp this is actually my data and this is neutrophils compared to macrophages and we can see the neutrophils they produce a lot more than control cells uh, but they produce a lot less than macrophages so even though they do, they can detect PAMPs and they can release inflammatory signaling molecules. It's not as major a role as macrophages, but they do contribute to that signaling. That's important. 
this is just another example this is a paper and they looked at tnf alpha il1 alpha il6 and il1 beta and if we look at the scale here this is tiny amounts of inflammatory cytokines they're tens of picograms uh, whereas a macrophage would typically release you know a thousand picograms or two thousand picograms of each of these um, cytokines and il6 is crazy so um, here the neutrophils are releasing 600 picograms whereas ma macrophage cell cultures can release 10,000 picograms so it's just to illustrate that the cytokine release they can do it but it's not their major function um, so up in the next video we're going to cover netosis and degranulation the other two key parts of the neutrophilic response